This is uh, Trevor Taylor from the Open Geospatial Consortium. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to moderate this uh, panel on uh, provincial and territorial uh, priorities and all things uh, geospatial. Um, we have three great panelists. Uh, we have Melanie Desjardins from uh, the Northwest Territories. We've got uh, James Britton from the province of Ontario uh, and also Colin McDonald from uh, Nova Scotia. Uh, so looking forward to a great panel. Uh, so I thought what we'd do here uh, is we'd give each of the panelists an opportunity to, to talk for uh, 10 minutes. Uh, we'll then open the floor for some questions and we've also prepared a few canned questions for later as well. So without further ado, uh, Melanie, would you like to start? Uh, and the main question is, um, you know, what are your jurisdiction's uh, main problems, priorities, gaps, issues and challenges? All right, well, uh, I guess I'll, I'll kick it off here. So again, those of you who saw me uh, yesterday, uh, my name is Melanie Desjardins. I'm uh, with the Government of the Northwest Territories. I'm the director of the NWT Center for Geomatics. Uh, I want to kind of highlight some of the priorities or, or overall government priorities. And uh, generally speaking, um, uh, they, we have a lot. We have a lot of priorities. Let's just put it that way. Uh, we, we're a consensus government, so we operate slightly differently than the rest of Canada, uh, and we have a, a fairly large mandate. So I picked out a few items that I thought would be relevant to the conversation today. Um, some of our government overarching priorities uh, that that can touch on geomatics uh, has to do with uh, e-services, uh, and and for us, we're always looking at how can we integrate the geospatial component into different types of e-services across government, whether that's how people get their driver's license, applying for permits uh, to, you know, to uh, cut wood or to go fishing or what have you, uh, you know, uh, all sorts of things that, that relate to e-services and how can we integrate that as much as possible, especially in new ways, ways that uh, people have not traditionally looked at geospatial information, so we're we're trying to to get into that uh, area uh, around broadband. Uh, of course, there are a lot of needs across the Northwest Territories around making sure that we all have uh, access to to broadband and, and then same level of access and uh, and and good quality uh, uh, internet, so that uh, you know folks who maybe are uh, our stakeholders who want to utilize our open geospatial resources and our open geospatial tools can can have access to those and not uh, be facing major lag times because of, of, of some of the broadband limitations in the communities across the territory. Uh, climate change is obviously another huge issue, not just for us, but I'm sure for many provinces and most provinces and territories across Canada. Uh, but being in the north, of course, we're seeing uh, the impacts of climate change um, I think the statistic I heard the other day is three times faster than the rest of southern Canada. So because of that, we're very much concerned with how can we better map some of those changes uh, related to climate change? How can we be more resilient to those changes, whether that's, you know, understanding the impacts to our infrastructure, our roads, things of that sort, uh, and, and using uh, either remote sensing or uh, different geospatial tools to, to better track some of that, uh, that climate change. Uh, one of the other pieces that's a priority for our government has to do with strategic infrastructure investment. So we're a very large territory. We have uh, many, we have 33 communities spread out and uh, many of those are flying communities only or communities that you can access only through winter road. Uh, so putting some of those uh, infrastructure investments obviously has a reliance on geospatial information, whether that be where do we get um, uh, granular resources to build these roads, uh, you know, and using either remote sensing or other geospatial tools to help with those efforts. Uh, that's one way that we can contribute um, on that and then monitoring those in, those pieces of infrastructure after they're put in place to make sure that they are resilient to some of those climate change impacts that I was talking about earlier. Uh, and lastly, well, not lastly, we again, we have a lot of priorities, but the, the last one I was gonna mention was just around open government. And this is obviously a concern, a concern for us in, in the geospatial world because uh, we consider ourselves leaders when it comes to sharing uh, our data and being open with our data. Uh, so we're always working with our clients uh, across uh, our departments to find new and better ways to uh, aggregate information and to make that information open uh, to, uh, to folks 
uh, well, obviously within our government, but outside of government as well. So what are the different strategies to make that information findable, accessible, uh, and especially when we're thinking about people within communities who may not have the same download speeds as those of us in Yellowknife or larger centers, what are some ways that we can uh, produce information in a more accessible way? Uh, so those are some of the, the key priorities overall from a government perspective. Uh, within our own team, within the Center for Geomatics, uh, as I mentioned, we are always working at uh, working with our clients to uh, centralize geospatial data because we're a decentralized uh, geospatial uh, team in, in a sense. We have some central resources that provide some spatial data infrastructure, uh, some centralized services around geospatial information, but we also have uh, a lot of pockets of expertise across our departments uh, where we have, you know, uh, folks who are creating a lot of geospatial information in those pockets and we're always working with them in better ways of centralizing that data back uh, for accessibility and, and providing some standards around metadata and things of that sort. Um, and and uh, one of the challenges, of course, uh, with us has to do with the size of the Northwest Territories, about 1.3 million square kilometers, uh, and, and with a fairly small population base, fairly small uh, uh, tax base as well, uh, not being able to easily and readily uh, create and access um, Earth observation products uh, all the time, and that being a very expensive uh, uh, endeavor that we're, we're constantly facing. So I did mention some of that as well in my talk a couple days ago, but it's probably going to be a recurring theme for me today, uh, just the cost of doing business when you're in such a large landmass and uh, not a lot of funds to, to, to operate that. So looking to uh, different ways to access either open tools, open data to, um, to better map uh, our territory. And that's about it for me right now. I'll let other people talk. All right, thanks, Melanie. Uh, James, same questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, so my name is James Britton. I'm the manager of mapping and geomatic services section with the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. Uh, given this long history in mapping, our ministry hosts the Land Information Ontario program, uh, or LEO. Uh, when it was formed in the late 90s, LEO focused on data and data sharing through a data, centralized data warehouse and a range of discovery and distribution tools. Uh, since then, uh, we've grown uh, dramatically and um, supported by our land and resources INIT cluster. We provide common geospatial services and products to about 3,000 staff who use GIS across the Ontario government. Uh, so that's a fairly sizable group. And I don't, I didn't use the term 3,000 JS staff because uh, some of those 3,000 are people who are specializing in other areas but would use JS uh, uh, as part of their job, uh, not full time. So these services include JS licensing and infrastructure. And as you can imagine, we're about 3,000 users across 20 ministries. Uh, the range of applications of geospatial technology and data across the OPS is very wide. So there's one of our challenges right there. Uh, beyond this internal uh, client base, we continue to meet the needs, excuse me, uh, of external users um, and these external users, the public, uh, businesses, the research community. Uh, these uh, tools and products uh, include GeoHub, which is our central uh, geospatial data discovery and access tool. Uh, we have a centralized public facing web mapping infrastructure, which supports a variety of applications across many industries. Uh, popular ones are Fish Online and Make a Topographic Map. We also have a Fire Mapper. Um, um, site as well. Uh, beyond these many business units, um, we use centralized resources to interact with the public, um, individual bu business areas within government. So uh, there's a pollinator health project run by uh, Ministry of Agriculture, for example, and, and uh, Environment uh, Conservation and Parks. So um, in summary, we have two very different uh, client groups, internal people using GIS and the external users who largely need to access and use our data and web mapping uh, platforms. So that's a backgrounder, but really that is uh, part of our challenge, uh, meeting the diverse needs um, of these groups. And I should make it clear that I speak for Leo, that common um, and public facing resource. What's going on now? Well, our main strategic direction over the next while is the application of Ontario's digital transformation agenda to geospatial services and products in the Leo portfolio and across government. Uh, this digital transformation agenda is outlined in a series of strategies, action plans, and directives. Um, but is perhaps best expressed by the direction of simpler, faster, and better end-to-end -end services across a people-centered government. 
um, which sounds as like sort of PR for technical folks like us, but uh, it's a really good uh, concept. Uh, it's emulating approaches taken by governments elsewhere, particularly the UK, Estonia, uh, Singapore, and Australia, to name but a few, and has some very profound effects on the way we um, we do things. Um, so search on Ontario Digital Service or Ontario Onwards uh, for more details on this broad direction. Uh, but let's look at what it means on a practical and geospatial level. Well, the first thing and what is uh, most exciting to me is um, driven by the Ontario Digital Service Standard, we'll be significantly increasing our end user engagement to better understand user needs. Uh, this research will go well beyond the traditional, how do we do this better, which we Done, been doing for probably 40 years since we started to go digital. Uh, it'll include directly include end users and consider broader questions as why do you want us to do this or how will you use this or do you even want us to do this in the first place? Uh, something uh, government not always does. Um, government has historically been hesitant to make this connection with end users, sometimes because the responses will be too varied um, and uh, we can't meet uh, everybody's requirements, uh, which can create backlash. Uh, sometimes limitations will make meeting all the ex expectations impossible. So um, we do have, um, so historically government hasn't done that outreach. Um, and quite frankly, doing this isn't always gonna be easy, even finding out who these users are in an open data world where we no longer record who uses our data. Uh, the alpha version of our service design playbook lays out an entirely different map for systems development within government. Um, depreciated are the large monolithic projects that move forward in a cascading glacier style. Uh, this approach is being replaced by rapid development of minimal viable services based on uh, user tested ideas and repeated incremental improvements based on user feedback. Again, something government's been hesitant to do. You know, got to make it perfect and make it right, which usually means it's way too expensive and way too late. So changing that approach now. So a whole range of things have to come along with these larger ideas, new skills, uh, development, like things like Agile and Lean, uh, scalable, simple tools, which can include open source, and um, quite significantly increased collaboration across historically siloed and very large organizations. But the big goal, and it is a challenge, is uh, a, a change in the culture, uh, uh, often of how we think, uh, but the underlying goal is a wholesale modernization of geospatial processes and systems, to facilitate, facilitate the delivery of efficient and user-centric services fit for the digital age. And if you look at places like uh, the UK, UK Geospatial Commission, you're seeing that sort of direction there. So uh, we're looking to map to that. So that will be a challenge. Uh, while not as big a challenge as um, Melanie's uh, problems, Ontario still faces the challenge of uh, a large province, uh, the relative uh, variation across the province. So in the south, we have areas that are populated and as financially well off as anywhere. In the north, virtually uh, unpopulated. Uh, money, especially COVID, will still be a challenge and finding consensus across divergent uh, end user views we'll see as a challenge. I'll leave it there. Thanks. All right, thanks, James. Colin, same question for you as well. Thanks, Trevor. And thank you, Jonathan and the GeoNight team for inviting me to participate in the panel today. First, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joining you from Mi'kmaq, the ancestral non ceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. We've uh, each been asked to discuss and share some of the organization's uh, priorities and challenges, each of our uh, organizations. So, I work with the government of Nova Scotia, so I'll share some items from a government perspective, but also I try to include where geomatics, uh, our geomatics team especially, is aligning and focusing our strength. My team is called Geonova, and we're the corporate geomatics office in the province of Nova Scotia. Our group is about 50 strong, and we provide geomatic services, and we partner with other provincial departments to create geographic data and solutions. Many of our partners have strong geomatics teams themselves uh, that we work alongside, while other clients may not have any geomatic staff. In our province, the current government came into power back in, I think, 2013, and they did something really kind of great for, for people like me uh, who are always looking to uh, figure out what the priorities of the day are. They published it right online. And uh, so if you go to the, the site, it's still there. And uh, they say, uh, right out in black and white with the priorities of the, the government are um, and continue this day. And they're healthy people and communities investing in early years in education, safe and connected communities and inclusive economic growth. So right there uh, for all to see. So as a leader of a highly innovative team of 
to Max Professionals, having this uh, info online is is just fantastic. Uh, I've been with government for uh, 20, almost 20 years. And sometimes those top goals and priorities may seem a little elusive, uh, but it's fantastic to be able to see that. Uh, and so you know where you are uh, within those priorities all the time. Even more recently, our uh, provincial government started publishing minister mandate letters online. So these are the, the letters that the premier writes specifically to each and every one of the ministers. Uh, getting those online has been part of an open information, open government movement. And so those provide even deeper insight into the specific uh, mandates for, for every department. And uh, recently we actually had a new premier, same, same government, uh, new premier. Uh, the priorities have remained largely the same as that site online um, lets us know what they are, but there's been some really significant additions. Climate change, for one, has taken uh, very much a front seat, um, enough to actually warrant a department name change from Nova Scotia environment to environment and climate change. And a second important uh, component of the new premier's platform is to right historical wrongs. So speaking directly to social and racial inequalities that have been systemic in our society. This is important inclusion into government priorities in my opinion. And uh, of course, uh, government response to the pandemic is top of mind here as it, I'm sure it is in other parts of the country. So our GNOV team, we're a, a corporate program. So we've got responsibility for many provincial geomatic services, such as our spatial referencing framework. That includes our passive and active monuments. The LiDAR program, aerial photography, civic addressing, topographic mapping, our spatial data infrastructure or SDI, and, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, and since we provide these services across government, we also have a pretty unique opportunity to be able to share the power of GIS. So it's key to know what those priorities of government are so you're able to focus your team's energy where it needs to be. This, this past year has been heavy for, for all of us. The, the pandemic has tested our mental health and strength, yet through all of this, it's also been a year of great innovation in geomatics. We've seen the dashboard uh, come front and center in almost every jurisdiction across North America. Great maps, visualizations, and other charts, you know, uh, they're all, and they're all getting updated every day by dedicated geomatics professionals. And I'd actually like to take a second here and say a big thank you to all those GIS geomatics professionals across this country who've been working on those dashboards. They've been doing it every day for the last 12 or 13 months. Uh, you know, I, know, I know the tools are getting easier uh, to develop some of these online uh, sites, but you know they look fantastic and uh, they're available to everybody. People with accessibility issues can use these tools online. And the types of visualizations, you know, every time you go back to a different jurisdiction site, they've, they've got new tools in there. And so everyone who's been involved in developing those and keeping those up to date every day, a big kudos uh, for the work that you've done um, to everyone there. In Nova Scotia, perhaps we're not that much different as we built our own COVID-19 dashboard last March, I think uh, late last March, early April. It didn't get released right away, but uh, you know, uh, members on the panel here, you know, uh, probably understand when you're collaborating with several departments, uh, and multiple health authorities, uh, I think Ontario has way more than us, but, uh, and your communications agency, there's a lot of oversight that is involved in, in releasing these kind of sites. Uh, in addition to the dashboard, there's been a lot of other work to support the pandemic. I'd like to share just a couple of interesting examples where GIS has turned out to be a significant game changer and, and aligning with government priorities here. Uh, the first example uh, deals with restricted areas. I think many of us are going through this right now. They just announced uh, last night here in Nova Scotia, there's another circuit breaker. Um, I've heard that term uh, all across the country. So it's where you've got uh, these geographic restrictions um, in your towns or uh, cities and people can't go in or out unless it's uh, they, they really need to. Well, here, uh, our communications team who, who looks after everything internet really, um, they were jumping on this right away uh, and great on them. Uh, 
you know, creating a spreadsheet of every address, every county, um, and, and they had a column in there that included whether or not the, the, the address was restricted or not, could they go to the next community, that, that kind of thing. Uh, they did a lot of great legwork in, in compiling that data, but we heard about it and, and we made some suggestions for improvement. So here in Nova Scotia, we've got this just amazing civic addressing program probably for the last 20 years or so. And it was initially built to support the province's 911 system. It serves us very well and it'll continue to do so uh, in the coming years as we migrate uh, to next gen 911. Uh, and it's a wonderful example actually of collaboration. Each and every municipality in Nova Scotia contributes authoritative data for street numbering, uh, roads, community boundaries into that single provincial database and do it every day. Uh, so that collaboration allows us to leverage that asset in a lot of different ways, including where are these restricted areas in Nova Scotia, and more importantly, in finding them. So now when you go to the government website on these circuit breakers, uh, as a citizen, you just type in your civic address into the page and it tells you if you're in a circuit breaker area or not. You know, And, and there's no real magic to it, but uh, sharing this because it's an example of aligning to current government priorities. So, you know, there's, you know, we're all geomatics, GIS folks probably on the call here today. Uh, so, you know, no magic. XML web service looking up a civic address database returns an XY coordinate. We've got a map service somewhere with the restricted areas all mapped out and that we send the coordinate where the citizen is to that service. It returns back the information about the restricted areas. No magic, but to public health and communication folks who are you know just heads down going a million miles an hour, it's so powerful. Another quick example of aligning to um, health priorities is with our vaccine booking system here in Nova Scotia. So I'm not sure if the other jurisdictions across the country have implemented a single booking system for, um, for the province or, or territory, but that's been our approach. Uh, and the initial feedback actually wasn't great. The interface had uh, too many options for finding clinics uh, in order to book your appointment. So public health was looking for a way to make it easier for citizens to find a clinic and complete their booking. You know, it's, people are stressed out enough. The last thing they need is another complicated website, uh, government website to navigate. So again, we kind of reached back into a similar bag of, of tricks, if you will. And we suggested the, the civic addressing as a starting point because, you know, we think everyone should know their civic address. You need to know for 911 anyway. So why not start there in the booking system as well? And so we reasoned that, you know, if we could figure out the XY coordinate for where the citizen was located, and we know all the XY coordinates of the vaccine clinics, it's pretty easy then to figure out the nearest locations to your own house. So why not just have the, the uh, booking system share that back in ascending order, you know, what's the closest one to your, to your house? So we worked with the, the vendor and within a day, they, they had built this in and it was released about a week ago. And over the first several days, we had uh, over a million hits from that system into our civic address database. So just a, a great example of, you know, you had a business driver of 911 and serving next, next gen 911 in the coming years, but you're able to leverage that authoritative data asset to serve something in uh, in the public side and it got a million hits in the first few days. Uh, so I really like that kind of uh, use integrating data on the public uh, and tying into priorities. So I shared a, a couple of these health examples because uh, they've been really important actually to the growth and awareness of geomatics in our jurisdiction. Um, and you know, it just speaks to uh, the importance of uh, authoritative data. And, you know, interestingly enough, neither of these sites have a map in it. All the maps are in the background. The data is in our SDI. We're using services, integrating it into these other websites and, and pulling the data from the maps back into those sites. I'd like to touch on one other priority for government, uh, Trevor, just a few more minutes. <laughs> uh, uh, several minutes ago, I mentioned the idea uh, of our um, current premier's idea of writing past wrongs. You know, racial discrimination and social inequities are present across our country and society. And sometimes we might think that geomatics, uh, there's no opportunity to contribute to turning this around, but I, I really believe that we can help. 
jurisdictions uh, are announcing um, a, a few uh, all over North America here that they're starting to take steps, uh, make progress in collecting some of the proper data that can really help on this topic. Uh, this will lead to more analysis and even greater awareness of the issues that, that we're facing um, here and across the world. But there's another area where we can help as well. And this is where you know, mapping professionals uh, come in. It's the place names that we have on our maps. Across Canada, there are names that are derogatory in nature. And we have an opportunity to change this in, in our generation. These place names hurt people in our society and they absolutely must be changed. We're, we're doing some work, I think some leading work on this right now. We're developing new websites to engage Nova Scotians in conversations about place names. Uh, and uh, the site is, is really gonna be geared to engaging citizens, but it's built using GIS software. So it's a, it's a really great example, I, I think, of engaging people in conversations, consulting, and doing it through location, doing it through geography and the tools that we, we all know and use. I'll touch on, on some challenges as well. Um, in many respects, I think the challenges uh, a jurisdiction, a government like uh, Nova Scotia faces, they're also the same as the priority. So in other words, the biggest challenges we face are things I mentioned earlier, like healthcare, our children's education, public safety, and the economy. And as a mapping agency in the province, it's our role to align our work with these priorities and challenges. So does that mean we abandon our current programs, LIDAR, photography, addressing, base mapping, SEI? No, of course not. But we need to be able to allocate our resources to respond to these government priorities. Um, and from a strictly geomatics perspective, we also have some unique challenges. Awareness continues to be a, a real challenge within government. So that awareness within our partner agencies of the power of GIS and, and what it can do uh, for them, is that's an ongoing and tireless job. But uh, I think we all, as leaders, we need to be relentless in that. You know, For example, we need to be in that conversation with public health and your communications agency about that next tool that they're gonna present to citizens during this pandemic. Um, James mentioned budgets. We could talk about budgets and funding. Um, we could all use more to create more innovative solutions, but we know they're not going to increase. And in fact, over the next few years, we might see a decrease in, in the base budgets across the public sector in Canada. So how to navigate that is going to be really important. And how will we still be able to maintain the same levels of service or better for our clients, continue to hire our um, important strategic vendors and continue to develop uh, new services? Uh, I think the short answer is to continue focusing on the priorities of your jurisdiction, stepping up, having a positive impact when these priorities uh, come to you. And I think that's the only way that we're gonna overcome those challenges. So thank you and back to you, Trevor. Thank you very much, Colin. Uh, just a reminder that if anybody attending the session has questions, uh, please use the Q&A function at the bottom. Uh, please use the Q&A function at the bottom. Um, so we'll get started, however, for a, for a question, uh, I think, for, for Melanie. Uh, we've heard the climate change come up a couple of times so far. So in uh, the Northwest Territories, how do you align the people, the data, the tools, and the communities uh, in such a way that you can make a positive impact on uh, climate change-related uh, issues? Uh, well, a good question, and um, and I guess I'll just kind of, it's a good segue from Colin's last point about, you know, budgets, we could all talk about budgets, and of course budget can be a bit of a limiting, limiting factor when you're trying to address things like climate change and how do you, how do you map things when, you know, like I said a while ago, we have a large landscape you know, and, and it's, it, it's very expensive to, to get new earth observation products. So that's where we uh, get to rely a lot on open, open source tools, open source data to, to do the work that we need to do. Uh, an example of that is work we've been doing over the last couple of years, leveraging some, um, some work that NRCAN uh, kicked off on uh, long-term change detection using Landsat uh, satellite imagery. Um, 
we use the tassel cap analysis to uh, to basically look at uh, the last almost 40 years of the Landsat uh, satellite imagery and uh, be able to uh, come up with a, a resulting image that pulls out different uh, factors of change uh, on the landscape. And so we were e recently able to do that and uh, and be able to use these these open resources to to derive a product that we're hoping to be able to use in the future as a as a type of a monitoring tool. So uh, that would be one of, I guess one of the biggest opportunities for us in in addressing uh, well, I won't say address climate change, but in trying to uh, understand and monitor what's going on in the Northwest Territories with regards to climate change is looking at that landscape de detection. And from there, we'll be able to detect things like permafrost uh, thaw slumps, uh, looking at coastal erosion, uh, looking at Arctic greening, uh, impacts of forest fire and forest fire regeneration. And of course, looking at how that might impact things like caribou populations, uh, looking at um, uh, the the anthropologic uh, footprint in the Northwest Territories and how that may impact uh, uh, you know uh, uh, the the caribou populations uh, that are also struggling because of, of climate change. So uh, those are all types of things that we can do with this type of product. Uh, you know there are other tools that we can leverage that can help us, of course, uh, things like drone technology. And we were lucky enough a couple of years ago to be able to uh, partner with. Uh, University of Alaska at Fairbanks, uh, Department of Transportation, DFO, um, and, uh, and a few other organizations in testing a beyond visual line of sight drone that uh, basically flew the entire stretch of the Inuvik Tutak Highway. Uh, and that was a really great, uh, great opportunity to try out new tools. And one of the, the benefits of being in the North is that, uh, you know, we have a lot of open airspace and so things like that can be tested fairly, fairly well. And, uh, and so we, we can provide a bit of a test bed for a lot of different research and, uh, and development around around you know, new technologies, new tools uh, to address things like climate change. All right, great, thanks. So we do have a couple of questions in the chat. This one's uh, for you, Colin. Uh, how do you identify derogatory street names using GIS? Is there a platform where the public can post street names they find offensive? Uh, what are the next step once a street name is de uh, deemed offensive? Yeah, well, thank you um, for, so, for asking the question. Um, so just step back uh, in place naming in, in Canada, there's is quite a, a history here. We have the Geographical Names Board of Canada. It's a central policy uh, group uh, that, that drives out the guidelines that we all use across the country, every province and territory uses, but the, the actual um, responsibility accountability for naming largely rests with the provinces. Uh, so. Here in Nova Scotia, we, we have um, a process that our team administers where people, if they want to uh, try and make a difference and, and um, suggest a, a name uh, for a change, they can get in, in touch with our group directly and we'll work with a, an applicant uh, through that process. Uh, but just, a, I think the question, uh, Trevor, you mentioned a street name. Uh, yep. Street name, um, typically is the responsibility of municipalities. Uh, so street name, you know, place name, mountain name, any of them can have uh, names that uh, could could be uh, deemed as derogatory. So street names typically are municipal um, jurisdiction and you can get in touch with a local municipality to share your, your thoughts, uh, they'll, they'll all thank me. Um, but uh, for other types of, of names, could be a mountain, could be a stream, uh, you know, you, you get in touch typically with your province or territory. Uh, having said that, uh, you know, the process in all the provinces and territories is there too, that you can, uh, if there's features that are unnamed, these features can be named as well, typically by going through that same process with a contact in each province or territory. Um, and was there part of it about a platform? Um, yeah, how, how is there a platform uh, where uh, people can submit uh, what they feel are offensive hmm. names? Uh, um, so. Yeah, 
Uh, I'm not aware of a single platform in Canada where somebody could do that. But like I mentioned, the, the responsibility is typically provincial or territorial for those names. So that would be a starting point. It's our team, our group in, in Nova Scotia. And it's typically within the mapping agency and sometimes in, in your culture and heritage agency uh, across the country as well. It just depends on each province or territory. Hope I answered that uh, well enough, but uh, don't hesitate to reach out uh, anonymous attendee uh, <laughs> if if you want to follow up on that. <laughs> Great. Well, we have another anonymous attendee with a question uh, to James. It's wonderful to hear that the province uh, has adopted agile and lean incremental user-based approach to service delivery and that the culture of restrictive top-down bureaucracy and developing public tools is being reimagined. In your opinion, what can the provincial experience teach the federal level of government's efforts towards their own transformation plan? which in many ways maintains a largely top-down approach to innovation. Okay, well, the first thing I'd do is respond by saying, um, <clears throat> we're all, we've just started down this path. Um, the, um, hold on, I'm gonna flip over to where it just got answered so I can still read it. Um, if you said, ask me, you know, is, is all our work being done that way? No. Um, it started at the center. So uh, if you look at the, uh, if you look up the Ontario Digital Service, that was sort of a think tank, if you like, uh, set up um, as the driver for this. Uh, they have, um, you know, uh, policies, action plans, direction, guidance that they're pushing outwards. Uh, like this, you know, I, you know, a lot of this is technology. To me, it's a lot of culture change, culture change right through the organization. Culture change, as we know, takes a long time. It goes in bits and starts. But, um, you know, showing the benefits, having clear guidance and direction is, is very, very helpful and, and it's migrating outwards. Uh, we're adopting it piece by piece. Again, as I mentioned, uh, there are 3,000 GS users across the Ontario government. Are all 3,000 of those going to be going agile, lean, and, and user-centric uh, tomorrow? No. Um, we're looking at pieces first, the big ones first. So incremental, definitely. Um, look to the people who are doing it uh, uh, elsewhere in the world. Look at the benefits that are coming from that. Uh, better products. You know, Look at the wins early. Uh, promote the wins and, and how they work. Again, some of the stuff out of uh, from the geospatial context is some, some of the things out of the UK Geospatial Commission come to mind, um, um, and, and things like that. So it's it's a slow process. Um, it's an exciting process. Um, you know, I'm you know, look at me. I'm sport, towards the end of my career. I start. You know, I, I joke with people. I was, I was first paid to put something on a map. Uh, I think all the Beatles are still alive, um, and so. Uh, it's, it's an exciting new thing to see, um, and it's getting people on board one at a time. Thanks. All right, uh, Melanie, another question for you. Um, given the vast uh, size of uh, the Northwest Territories, <clears throat> so what are your, SD, uh, your SDI uh, needs? Uh, you know, what challenges exist, uh, you know, around things like uh, data analytics, management and the need for standards? Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, so we we do have a spatial data infrastructure where we centralize um, what we call our spatial data warehouse for uh, government departments. We still have some challenges in, um, in trying to, I guess, adapt our standards to all the data sets, whether that be like something as simple as, you know, data naming standards to making sure that, uh, you know, the, our metadata is properly, you know, pr properly provided and, and then turning that around into uh, tools for data discovery. So I, I'd say that uh, enabling better data discovery is probably one of our larger, um, larger challenges. Uh, but also because we're fairly distributed across the Northwest Territories and we have offices across uh, across many of our communities, uh, trying to get that data from from our central uh, repositories in Yellowknife back to the communities is is definitely a challenge. It's uh, uh, you know it's it's often becomes a thing of, of clipping and shipping data, which sounds kind of like uh, 
you know, we're going back in time a little bit and it's not because we don't have REST services available, but, uh, you know, it comes down to sometimes performance and how somebody may want to interact and work with some of that data. So uh, at times, you know, we've seen where we've had, uh, you know, different copies of our spatial data infrastructure sit at, in different communities to enable, uh, you know, more efficient data access and, and things of that sort. So making sure that everything kind of reconnects back to our central warehouse. Um, uh, and uh, I, I'd say probably another challenge around um, our data management is, is around data analytics and making sure that we have a really good understanding of what data is being accessed. When is it being accessed? Uh, is it being leveraged in efficiently a way as possible? Uh, and that's something that we're, we are implementing tools this year, actually. It happens to be one of our priorities for my team to look at in, implementing better analytics tools and metrics um, of success around how our, our data is being leveraged and making sure that that data is optimized, uh, you know, for the web, optimized for ingestion into all these different uh, line of business applications. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Got another uh, question from the attendees. Uh, feel, feel free for any of the, uh, one of the panelists to respond to it. Uh, it's the RaiderSat Constellation mission has been around since 2019. Have the provinces and territories been able to get all the data that you needed? And do you have the capacity to actually make use of it? So don't know who wants to go first on that one. So I can, I, I can take a stab at it if you okay. like. Um, we, we have been uh, very fortunate in that we've had partnerships with uh, Indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada, or I guess they're called CIRNAC now. Uh, we've had partnerships there, partnerships with, our, uh, with uh, CSA uh, in, in leveraging RadarSat 2 and now uh, the RadarSat Constellation Mission. We rely on uh, SAR data quite a bit for uh, permafrost deformation analysis. And so uh, building these uh, stacks of data uh, and having some really uh, dense stacks of data over communities, over runways, road infrastructure, and things of that sort is really important. So we've been tasking probably since about 2010, 2011, and uh, we're starting to see some mature stacks. Of course, now with RCM, we're going to build you know new new stacks and new stacks that will need to mature over time uh, to get uh, to get some good coherence there with our data. Uh, but it is something that we uh, that we've been fortunate to leverage. Uh, I'm not sure if that's the same case across uh, across every jurisdiction, but uh, for RCM uh, specifically, when the call came out about you know uh, we're going to be we're going to be releasing this soon, and people with interest can uh, uh, can apply and put their uh, their um, areas of interest and and use cases forward uh, for for access to data. Uh, we were we were right in there uh, at the very early start and. Uh, and as a result, we were able to kind of get ourselves in line for access to that data. And we've been uh, able to start receiving some of that data. So uh, it's, it's something I'm, I'm really thankful for. And I really look forward to, uh, to be able to continue utilizing, especially around the high repeatability of RCM. That's really important for us as we're looking at seasonal variation for uh, permafrost deformation and how that might impact things like a runway. Uh, is super important for us. And before the older stacks uh, with uh, RareSat 2 was a little bit more difficult to um, to get the the right kind of uh, you know stack built up for you know some some of that seasonal variability. If you want to look you know specific times of year uh, and 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 how you how you do that analysis, really important to get the the mature stacks and to to have the higher repeatability across. Uh, across each month and each year. Um, so yeah, we've been we've been lucky with it. Great. Uh, James or Colin, would you like to comment on uh, your use of uh, RCM or RaiderSat data? I think Colin would have something to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, James. Uh, <laughs> we talk a lot. <laughs> uh, CSA reached, did some outreach with us a, a couple of years ago. I think it was in 2019. They came down and, and we had a nice session with them. Uh, but to be honest, uh, we, we haven't had any uh, dialogue with them since. Um, so I think it's something that, that we'll have to, to reach out to them. So no, uh, uh, I know that our group, uh, and I'm not aware of any other groups at this time in, in the provincial government, that um, have been using any of the new RCM uh, data products, certainly going back to earlier radar sat campaigns and we have used that data in the past. But uh, to my knowledge, we have not been using the new RCM data 
uh, yet, but uh, look forward to um, reaching out to CSA uh, on that opportunity. James. Uh, I would suggest our uh, our experience, and again, I don't know everything all the 3,000 do, um, mm -hmm. but certainly uh, I, I say our experience by and large is the same as yours, Colin. Um, we did some uh, work with uh, radar sat imagery a number of years back, uh, looking at uh, ice breakup in the in the far north, our far north, um, and some other pieces like that. Uh, in the second part of the question, I think that's pretty. That's a very uh, good question. Um, we've lost some of our ability, our our skill sets and staff retiring uh, who were able to work. I mean, the radar working with radar is. Uh, a specialized component uh, within a you know a specialized subset within remote sensing, which is already a subset of uh, geospatial work. So th uh, that becomes a bigger threat for us. Uh, but it, I would say our work has been historically very targeted uh, around specific actions and that sort of thing. But not we don't uh, we're not using it at a wholesale level. Um, let's say we like we would run basic imagery or um, you know lidar data even. Trevor. Uh Melanie, you touched on data analytics uh, a few minutes ago. I just want to jump on that a little bit uh, and okay, share sure. uh, a trend we're, we're seeing here. And it's, uh, you know, I think the analytics, the spatial analytics uh, in our jurisdictions has been, it's pretty mature. Um, you know, James mentioned there's 3,000 users, um, maybe not all power users, but a lot. And James, you might be seeing this in Ontario, but we're certainly seeing it here in, in Nova Scotia, the um, kind of a, a new generation of data scientists coming into government. And, and they're not necessarily GIS or geomatic spatial type users. They're using uh, data and analytics platforms and they're popping up all over the place in government. <laughs> um, we're in, in, in GIS, uh, you know, we it's, it's kind of settled down the different, uh, you know, still a lot of flavors out there but this is something that's happening in the data analytics community in, in our government so you've got people using power bi they're using sap they're using cognos and tableau uh, and they're all coming from their programs because i think it says right in their manuals and all these software we support mapping in our platform but go ask your gis department for a shape file <laughs> and then <laughs> add it in um i'd like to stop doing that because you know we want people to go to the authoritative source consume that data and uh, so we're trying to come up with a strategy in Nova Scotia how to work with all these data and analytics platforms so they just don't come uh, looking for a shape file and then they it's out of date as soon as you give it to them and the same with all of those other departments uh, gotta talk to these uh, DNA or data analytics platforms about consuming, Melanie, you mentioned REST services before, but consuming services so that they can come to our SDIs as that single source of truth for geographic data in government. And they don't have to come and ask us for a shapefile. But I wanted to raise it because I'm sure in uh, uh, public services size of Ontario, James, you're probably getting lots of these uh, groups pop up all over the place looking for Map data. Yeah, putting putting my OGC hat on for a moment and stepping away from being the moderator, this is one of the prime drivers of the new OGC uh, API standards and that whole uh, move uh, to not only uh, make sure that geospatial standards are more web-like, but to make it really, really easy for developers and product managers uh, to implement and get at the data uh, easily without having to, uh, you know, go down the, the corridor, ask for a shape file, get it emailed them uh, from them, and then suddenly that shape file is out of date. There's a huge movement right now uh, to develop a whole new generation of uh, OGC, as I say, API standards, developer friendly, implementer friendly, come with code, uh, you know, examples of code uh, to basically recognize the fact that, you know, uh, the days are gone where you have to be specifically a geospatial developer uh, only to work on geospatial data. This is an indication of a, a need for mainstreaming. Um, and the fact that we are getting closer to the mainstream than we ever have been before. So that's just my OGC hat. So I'll put my moderate, uh, moderator hat back on again. Uh, we do have uh, another question from the floor. Uh, do you think uh, there will ever be a time when the provinces and territories will start to be more consistent in the types of open data that they provide and the ways that they do it? 
So who wants to take that one up first? I'll jump in. I'll be right. brief uh, <laughs> so the others can jump in. I think this is a good one that we probably all have some opinions on. Uh, yeah, I think I think so. Uh, you know, the, the open data portals are uh, a generation behind our geospatial portals, right? Uh, in, in the geospatial world, we've been uh, working on standards, interoperability. I think uh, Mel mentioned metadata. Um, Trevor's here from OGC. So, so we're aware of interoperability and standards and even common um, uh, data across jurisdictions. So we, we've kind of had a head start on this and, and open data platforms. I mean, they've been fantastic, but most of them probably had to get out of the gates and get out and start releasing data quickly, right? So I think it'll come back. Um, but, you know, in, in the geospatial world, I, I'd like to cite uh, the GeoBase initiative under uh, the Canadian Council on Geomatics. GeoBase is all about the best available uh, base mapping data for the country. Um, every province, every jurisdiction contributing to it at the same specs and, and making it available in the exact same ways. So that's where we've been. Um, and, and I do think the open data world with our help in this community will will get there. Comments from uh, Melanie or James? So. I'll let James go. Okay. Um, yeah, we have we have the tools, we have you know the willpower, um, you know, and we're getting better. Everything was just mentioned. Um, the reality is, though, is and and is that each province uh, dr the drivers for creating data. For at least, let's start with that. Uh, simply, um, the drivers creating data for getting the data and creating data is is different in each province. Um, you know, it starts with things like the sizes of the province. So you know, you look at lidar. LIDAR. New Brunswick totally covered, driven by the uh, you know resource sector there, uh, achievable. Uh, in on Quebec recently, you know their uh, natural resources driven project, uh, same thing there. Historically in in uh, West uh, tried again tried the forest industry. Ontario is much more patchwork. Uh, typically, it's been driven by um, municipal layer level as well. Some federal involvement so, are now being driven by um, flood mapping and that sort of thing. So the reality is different and that means that what will be collected uh, will be different how it will be collected is becoming more mainstream although we get technological change you know every year it seems a different sensor is available um, we can usually scale it down so it's it'll be better um, it'll always be driven by different realities however uh, and, and a lot of those are economic um, you know the economies of each province are different uh, the relationship with the federal government in each province is different. Um, we we roll up a lot of our data, so our road network, for example, gets thrown up to the feds and put into the national network. Uh, we make data available. Uh, our our um, our uh, geo catalog is now federated with the federal one, and uh, so you're seeing it'll be better. Um, there will still be differences, however. Yeah, and I'll just jump in here, I guess, to say the, the same as James. There's always going to be uh, different drivers in different jurisdictions. I was listening to Colin talk about his civic addressing a while ago, and I was coveting his civic addressing data and coveting, you know, Leo and all, all, all the data discovery tools that they have there. You know, like, uh, I tend to covet a lot of other what other people have in, in the, the geo, open geospatial world because... Uh, because we have a different paradigm altogether in in the Northwest Territories, and some of the data sets that we work towards aren't uh, aren't you know those common data sets that you might get in um, in other parts of Canada. So you know we do co contribute as well to a national road data layer. Uh, we will be contributing towards you know the uh, a, a building layer, national building layer, when that uh, that standardized uh, data model I was talking about uh, yesterday. Uh, you know, we contribute where we can, but uh, getting a consistent set of data across Canada, um, you know, you're, you're going to get different flavors. And I think that really speaks to what uh, the Canadian Council on Geomatics is there for, is to help to try to 
you know, really push those standards, push those common data models across uh, across the board, and uh, provinces and territories uh, can adopt when they're ready. And that and that's the the key factor there is when they're ready, because the state of readiness is not always the same. And uh, and for us, we have some work to do. We have we have a lot of great data sets, mind you. Don't get me wrong. In the Northwest Territories, we have a lot of fantastic data sets that may not even exist in other parts of the country, but uh, they're based off of what our drivers are and uh, and you know eventually hopefully we'll get there with addressing and we'll be up there with uh, Ontario and Nova Scotia. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe just another quick question for you uh, for, for you Melody because the uh, the concept of uh, capabilities and capacity has uh, come up a couple of times. So um, you know given the uh, the variable uh, capacity and capabilities uh, around the country um, so what gaps do you see that uh, Northwest Territories has in uh, capacity building and how can the broader Canadian community help? Ooh, on, uh, so on capacity building, I mean, we look at that in terms of uh, allowing, doing things to allow our, our stakeholders to use and understand our data and our tools. And so uh, this is really important to us. We, uh, we recognize a lot of our uh, potential users are, you know, sit in within those communities. They're, you know, they are those people who are out on the land doing work on the land, uh, whatever that may be. They could be our stakeholders in industry, but typically industry, you know, they have that general understanding and knowledge on geomatics. So for us, that capacity building is really working with our community members and learning how to use uh, tools and data sets, but also making those tools and data set uh, bring that value chain to a point where, uh, you know, you don't have to be a geomatics expert to utilize some of these tools. One of the things we've been doing and working with uh, Natural Resources Canada is around uh, these uh, starter kits and, and um, uh, providing data in these easily accessible formats uh, so that, uh, you know, you can just b basically plug and play. Uh, and uh, we also have done quite a bit of work in, uh, in the territory, whether it be through uh, individualized workshops, uh, developing different training packages uh, to help uh, to help bring different uh, uh, groups uh, up to speed on different uh, geospatial tools and resources. We've worked with the Indigenous Mapping Workshop up in Inuvik to try to bring some of those common tool sets uh, in our region and, and, and educate folks where we can and just to be there and make ourselves available uh, around, you know, around building that capacity, that geospatial capacity. All right, thanks. One more question from the floor. I think we're almost out of time here, but the uh, question is, if the feds are consuming and managing the data from the provinces, then wouldn't the provinces need to comply with federal requirements? Is that correct? Who wants to take that one? James, I think you mentioned that uh, you were providing data to the federal government, uh, road networks. We do. Um, we have some different requirements, again, because of scale. Um, we, we connect our data. Municipalities connect their data to us. We connect our data to the feds. So because of the differences of scale, we have some other requirements. Uh, generally, however, we can take our data out and provide it to the feds in a way that they need. Uh, again, that's... Um, and this is going to change again because, you know, a part of that discussion I was talking about at the beginning was uh, we're going to be going back out because, you know, an issue, let's say, for example, linear referencing, do we or don't we, do we, don't we? It's been a question going back and forth for years. Um, we may be changing that based on, on uh, uh, user engagement. So um, we do as, to much, as much as possible. Uh, the reality is, is if the federal government is not providing money, then... Um, they don't have a direct say in, in how a province would do it. And you know, Ontario works, everybody else works this way. Uh, typically each province finds a different, you know, as I said, has different drivers for um, funding and, and for uh, direction, uh, different legislation in some cases. Um, so I'd say as far as possible, yes. Uh, years ago, the federal government would give us money to um, take our data and, 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 and uh, uh, make adjustments to it for their requirements. Uh, that doesn't happen anymore. So uh, I would say then the quick answer to that would be as much as possible, but not perfectly. But again, mm -hmm. things like open standards and better design and I think it makes it much more easily easier to uh, make those adjustments. Great. 
what well, just add on to that, Trevor, that sure. uh, the, the work at the Canadian Council on Geomatics and uh, through Melanie as her chair uh, allows for those conversations to happen between all the provinces and territories when there is a uh, common ground for um, contributing to national data sets and, and national layers. That's the uh, very successful collaborative body in Canada where those conversations take place. Um, so just uh, a lot of people may be on the line uh, and the call, uh, they're maybe not familiar with CCOG, hopefully the Cotton Mills uh, chat yesterday, but it's a, it's a wonderful uh, example of collaboration in the, in the public sector anyway in Canada, uh, where, where these conversations uh, happen. All right. All right. Thank you. All right, so we're at the end of our one hour time slot here. Uh, so thanks to all the panelists for taking the time to uh, uh, respond to various questions today. Super interesting stuff. And uh, thanks to uh, Jonathan and the GeoIgnite team again for the opportunity to do so. So with that, uh, Jonathan, I'll hand it over to you. So. Thank you very much, Trevor. And thank you to our panelists, Melanie, Colin, James. A lot of appreciation for being here with us to close out GeoIgnite. This is the third time we've done this. This is the second time we've done it online, um, doing it safely, but still coming together, which I think is really important. And for the first time, we're doing it um, um, with uh, French translation to try to be open and inclusive. And uh, we're going to look to continue to grow in that direction. Uh, I'm only going to take a minute here. We're going to be wrapped up really soon. Uh, I want to make... Um, a uh, special thank you to the participants, to the audience. Um, I've already thanked our sponsors and our, our teams. Um, I wanna take a moment to thank the community uh, because this is a community effort and I appreciate the people that uh, took the time out of their days to come and learn and engage. It's been a, just a terrific experience. Thank you all very much. And we're, we're gonna be back next year. I hope that uh, the panel could come back. I, I'd love to keep it as part of the, the conference every year. Uh, is that something you, you think we could do? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was great. I, I enjoyed it, Jonathan. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, this was really good. Congratulations, right. Jonathan, on another great, great event. Yes, this was yeah. amazing. Well done. Well done, everybody. All right. Thank you all so much. Uh, so that's it for the three-day main conference. Next week, we have our workshop week. There's lots of free workshops there. So everybody fill your boots. Um, and we're going to try to um, just keep keep doing stuff like this. All right, everybody. Um, right. Bye. Thanks, Jonathan. Okay. Thanks. Well done. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Stay safe. Stay safe. Yeah.